Chapter 10 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shen. Chapter 10 Denials and Affirmations. Thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. All the good that is to be made manifest in man's life is already an accomplished fact in divine mind, and is released through man's recognition or spoken word. So he must be careful to decree that only the divine idea be made manifest, for often he decrees, through his idle words, failure or misfortune. It is therefore of the utmost importance to word one's demands correctly, as stated in a previous chapter. If one desires a home, friend, position, or any other good thing, make the demand for the divine selection. For example, infinite spirit, open the way for my right home, my right friend, my right position. I give thanks that it now manifests under grace in a perfect way. The latter part of this statement is most important. For example, I knew a woman who demanded a thousand dollars. Her daughter was injured and they received a thousand dollars indemnity, so it did not come in a perfect way. The demand should have been worded in this way. Infinite Spirit, I give thanks that the one thousand dollars, which is mine by divine right, is now released and reaches me under grace, in a perfect way. As one grows in a financial consciousness, he should demand that the enormous sums of money, which are his by divine right, reach him under grace, in perfect ways. It is impossible for man to release more than he thinks is possible, for one is bound by the limited expectancies of the subconscious. He must enlarge his expectancies in order to receive in a larger way. Man so often limits himself in his demands. For example, a student made the demands for $600 by a certain date. He did receive it, but heard afterwards that he came very near receiving a thousand dollars, but he was given just six hundred as a result of his spoken word. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Wealth is a matter of consciousness. The French have a legend giving an example of this. A poor man was walking along a road when he met a traveler, who stopped him and said, My good friend, I see that you are poor. Take this gold nugget, sell it, and you will be rich all your days. The man was overjoyed at his good fortune and took the nugget home. He immediately found work and became so prosperous that he did not sell the nugget. Years passed, and he became a very rich man. One day he met a poor man on the road. He stopped him and said, My good friend, I will give you this gold nugget, which, if you sell, will make you rich for life. The mendicant took the nugget, had it valued, and found it was only brass. So we see, the first man became rich through feeling rich, thinking the nugget was gold. Every man has within him a gold nugget. It is his consciousness of gold, of opulence, which brings riches into his life. In making his demands, man begins at his journey's end, that is, he declares he has already received. Before ye call, I shall answer. Continually affirming establishes the belief in the subconscious. It would not be necessary to make an affirmation more than once if one had perfect faith. One should not plead or supplicate, but give thanks repeatedly that he has received. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. This rejoicing, which is yet in the desert, state of consciousness, opens the way for release. The Lord's Prayer is in the form of command and demand, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors.
and ends in praise. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. So prayer is command and demand, praise and thanksgiving. The student's work is in making himself believe that with God all things are possible. This is easy enough to state in the abstract, but a little more difficult when confronted with a problem. For example, it was necessary for a woman to demonstrate a large sum of money within a stated time. She knew she must do something to get a realization, for realization is manifestation, and she demanded a lead. She was walking through a department store when she saw a very beautiful pink enamel paper cutter. She felt the pull towards it. The thought came, I haven't a paper cutter good enough to open letters containing large checks. So she bought the paper cutter, which the reasoning mind would have called an extravagance. When she held it in her hand, she had a flash of a picture of herself opening an envelope containing a large check, and within a few weeks she received the money. The pink paper cutter was her bridge of active faith. Many stories are told of the power of the subconscious when directed in faith. For example, a man was spending the night in a farmhouse. The windows of the room had been nailed down, and in the middle of the night he felt suffocated and made his way in the dark to the window. He could not open it, so he smashed the pane with his fist, drew in drafts of fine fresh air, and had a wonderful night's sleep. The next morning, he found he had smashed the glass of a bookcase, and the window had remained closed during the whole night. He had supplied himself with oxygen simply by his thought of oxygen. When a student starts out to demonstrate, he should never turn back. Let not that man who wavers think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A student once made this wonderful statement. When I ask the Father for anything, I put my foot down and I say, Father, I'll take nothing less than I've asked for, but more. So man should never compromise. Having done all, stand. This is sometimes the most difficult time of demonstrating. The temptation comes to give up, to turn back, to compromise. He also serves who only stands and waits. Demonstrations often come at the eleventh hour because man then lets go, that is, stops reasoning, and infinite intelligence has a chance to work. Man's dreary desires are answered drearily, and his impatient desires long delayed or violently fulfilled. For example, a woman asked me why it was she was constantly losing or breaking her glasses. We found she often said to herself and others with vexation, I wish I could get rid of my glasses. So her impatient desire was violently fulfilled. What she should have demanded was perfect eyesight. But what she registered in the subconscious was simply the impatient desire to be rid of her glasses, so they were continually being broken or lost. Two attitudes of mind cause loss. Depreciation, as in the case of the woman who did not appreciate her husband, or fear of loss, which makes a picture of loss in the subconscious. When a student is able to let go of his problem, cast his burden, he will have instantaneous manifestation. For example, a woman was out during a very stormy day, and her umbrella was blown inside out. She was about to make a call on some people whom she had never met, and she did not wish to make her first appearance with a dilapidated umbrella. She could not throw it away, as it did not belong to her. So in desperation, she exclaimed, Oh God, you take charge of this umbrella. I don't know what to do. A moment later, a voice behind her said, Lady, do you want your umbrella mended? There stood an umbrella mender. She replied, Indeed I do. 
The man mended the umbrella while she went into the house to pay her call, and when she returned, she had a good umbrella. So there is always an umbrella mender at hand on man's pathway when one puts the umbrella or situation in God's hands. One should always follow a denial with an affirmation. For example, I was called on the phone late one night to treat a man whom I had never seen. He was apparently very ill. I made the statement, I deny the appearance of disease. It is unreal, therefore cannot register in his consciousness. This man is a perfect idea in divine mind, pure substance expressing perfection. There is no time or space in divine mind. Therefore, the word reaches instantly its destination and does not return void. I have treated patients in Europe and have found that the result was instantaneous. I am asked so often the difference between visualizing and visioning. Visualizing is a mental process governed by the reasoning or conscious mind. Visioning is a spiritual process governed by intuition or the superconscious mind. The student should train his mind to receive these flashes of inspiration and work out the divine pictures through definite leads. When a man can say, I desire only that which God desires for me, his false desires fade from the consciousness and a new set of blueprints is given him by the master architect, the God within. God's plan for each man transcends the limitation of the reasoning mind and is always the square of life, containing health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. Many a man is building for himself in imagination a bungalow when he should be building a palace. If a student tries to force a demonstration through the reasoning mind, he brings it to a standstill. I will hasten it, saith the Lord. He should act only through intuition or definite leads. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. Trust also in Him, and He will bring it to pass. I have seen the law work in the most astonishing manner. For example, a student stated that it was necessary for her to have a hundred dollars by the following day. It was a debt of vital importance which had to be met. I spoke the word, declaring spirit was never too late, and that the supply was at hand. That evening she phoned me of the miracle. She said that the thought came to her to go to her safety deposit box at the bank to examine some papers. She looked over the papers, and at the bottom of the box was a new $100 bill. She was astounded, and she said she knew she had never put it there, for she had gone through the papers many times. It may have been a materialization, as Jesus Christ materialized the loaves and fishes. Man will reach the stage where his word is made flesh, or materialized, instantly. The fields, ripe with the harvest, will manifest immediately, as in all of the miracles of Jesus Christ. There is a tremendous power alone in the name Jesus Christ. It stands for Truth Made Manifest. He said, Whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. The power of this name raises the student into the fourth dimension, where he is freed from all astral and psychic influences, and he becomes unconditioned and absolute, as God himself is unconditioned and absolute. I have seen many healings accomplished by using the words, In the name of Jesus Christ. Christ was both person and principle, and the Christ within each man is his Redeemer and salvation. The Christ within is his own fourth-dimensional self, the man made in God's image and likeness. This is the self which has never failed, never known sickness or sorrow, was never born and has never died. It is the resurrection and the life of each man. No man cometh to the Father save by the Son, means that God, the universal, working on the place of the particular, becomes the Christ in man. And the Holy Ghost 
means God in action. So daily, man is manifesting the trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Man should make an art of thinking. The master thinker is an artist and is careful to paint only the divine designs upon the canvas of his mind, and he paints these pictures with masterly strokes of power and decision, having perfect faith that there is no power to mar their perfection, and that they shall manifest in his life the ideal made real. All power is given man, through right thinking, to bring his heaven upon his earth, and this is the goal of the game of life. The simple rules are fearless faith, non-resistance, and love. May each reader be now freed from that thing which has held him in bondage through the ages, standing between him and his own, and know the truth which makes him free, free to fulfill his destiny, to bring into manifestation the divine design of his life, health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. End of chapter 10. Recording by Amy Conger. In this chapter, Florence Scovel Shin emphasizes the importance of using affirmations to manifest your desires and overcome challenges. She begins by explaining the role of denials in the process, which involves letting go of negative beliefs and patterns that hinder your progress. Denials are like pruning the dead branches of a tree to allow new growth. Shin then delves into the concept of affirmations, which are positive statements or declarations of the good you wish to attract into your life. She highlights that affirmations must be rooted in faith and an unwavering belief in God's abundant blessings. By consistently affirming what you desire, you activate the law of attraction and draw those desires closer to you. The chapter illustrates how affirmations work by sharing stories of individuals who transformed their lives through the power of positive thinking and faith in God's benevolence. Shin stresses that the words we speak and the thoughts we hold shape our reality, making it essential to choose our words and thoughts wisely. Chapter 10 of The Game of Life and How to Play It is a source of inspiration and empowerment for those seeking to align their lives with Christian teachings and spiritual growth. Florence Scovel Shin's writing exudes a sense of optimism and faith in the limitless possibilities available to us when we tap into the divine energy. Her emphasis on denials and affirmations as tools for personal transformation is both practical and spiritual. It reminds us that we have the power to shape our destiny by aligning our thoughts and words with the divine plan. Shin's stories of individuals who overcame adversity through affirmations serve as compelling examples of what can be achieved when we choose faith over fear. This chapter resonates with those seeking a deeper connection to their faith and a more purposeful existence. It teaches us that our beliefs and words are potent forces that can either limit us or set us free. By following the principles outlined in this chapter, readers can embark on a journey towards a life filled with abundance, joy, and spiritual fulfillment. Chapter 10 of The Game of Life and How to Play It is a powerful reminder of the transformative power of faith, affirmations, and positive thinking, all grounded in Christian teachings. It is an uplifting and engaging guide that inspires readers to take control of their lives and manifest their deepest desires with the support of divine grace.